people get in the middle of getting into love. They don't know how to do it just right, but they don't want to let me move around or walk like I'm somebody. They want to play like a man's hand on a jumping band. Left it there, laying on a bandstand, thinking about something, and it was only just a tramp on the road, a whole boat. Well, somebody, baby, wants you to know who was a reflection of someone's reflection that was reflecting upon you. That was reflected through someone's reflection. That was your reflection. You start with two, you keep on in the circles on the sunshine down. See her on the soap and it's right on the wild. I keep walking on my now string. Thinking about you, wishing you were here. Or not necessarily here. Just there with yourself to be anything you want to be because holding me up seems to be holding the males up and the jails up and all the things that hold up the things that hold us down in the holes. Now procedures on preachers on will of God jump. Money's in the pocketbook or Marines head too. Gold's on gold head, shining's on Fred bed, and walking along in the sea of silver with you. Penny, Lincoln on stink, he did and he got a mic in my sink, thinking about what someone said. Somewhere, some place where someone was dead. This podcast assumes that you have a general knowledge of the Tate LaBianca murders. Sharon Tate Polanski, Jay Sebring, Wojciech Frykowski, Abigail Folger, and Stephen Parent were murdered on Cielo Drive in Los Angeles on August 9, 1969. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were slain in their Los Feliz residence the following night. Charles Manson, Charles Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Quinwinkle, and Leslie Van Houten were convicted of those murders. Say hello to the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. This podcast assumes that you have a general knowledge of the Tate LaBianca murders. Sharon Tate Polanski. Excuse me. And excuse me, folks. That was unintended. Hit the wrong button. That's what happens when you're live. I hope everybody can hear me. Looks like my uh, mute's off. My camera's on. And I'm going to look at the feed to find out that everybody can hear me. Hello? Yes? Everything okay? I'm going to continue on. Hi there, George. Nobody's nobody's going crazy. Sorry about hitting the wrong button. It won't happen again. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everybody to the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast, Live 6. I'm George Stimson. Uh, I host the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast uh, this evening, uh, May 7th, uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, I want to thank everybody, first of all, who's responded and given such an enthusiastic response to this podcast, the viewers, uh, all the people who've reached out to me and the people that I've reached out to. Uh, They've all been uh, very cooperative and positive, and I'm grateful for that. You've given me a lot to think about, and uh, I hope I've given you people some things to think about. So uh, I do have a show tonight with a guest, and I can see that he's already here, and I appreciate that very much. But before I get into uh, the program tonight, I I want to uh, touch on something that we talked about in the last podcast a little bit. And this is, uh, this is a subject that's apparently of interest to a lot of people uh, concerning this case. And of course, I'm talking about uh, Wojciech Fajkowski's pants, because some people have a lot of concern that in the death scene photos, his pants are 
somewhat pulled down and that's uh, leading to all kinds of wild speculation about what was really going on there that night. Uh, I was asked about that last week and I offered uh, as an answer that perhaps after uh, the meal uh, that they had, and I don't know if he ate at the coyote, some people dispute that, but he did have a, uh, a one third full stomach, according to the autopsy report. So he did eat somewhere that perhaps he loosened his belt when he got down uh, on the couch for his final nap. And that when he got up and everything started happening, uh, his pants were loose because of that. Well, I've since learned uh, looking at the uh, autopsy report for Wojciech Fikowski, they have this notation here and I'm gonna bring it up. It says clots. Now that's how a police officer spells clothes. And the clothing is generally uh, characterized as hippie type. And if you look down uh, almost a little bit halfway down, it says low pajama type of hippie pants. So Wojciech was basically wearing pajamas that night. And if you look at the uh, death scene photos of him, I'm not gonna show them here, but you can see that he's wearing uh, pajamas. So perhaps because he was not wearing uh, that substantial a pair of trousers, that's another reason why they got someone pulled down when he was crawling across the ga grass in his final, uh, uh, final uh, minutes on earth, seconds perhaps. Okay, so now that we've uh, cleared that up and added that into the pot, I wanna bring on my guest and I wanna introduce him. His name is uh, David York. And I reached out to David because of his uh, earlier response to the show I did about the blood. And he seemed to uh, be authoritative and kind of knowledgeable. So I reached out to him to see if he could give us some more insights into the blood stain analysis. And I'm looking here, just a minute, it seems that everybody can hear me. So that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna bring David on now and I'm gonna let him uh, introduce himself uh, to the extent that he wants to. And then we will start the, uh, we will start the uh, the show. Here he comes, David. Hey you... George, how are you? I'm fine. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Good, yeah, good. Very glad. I'm glad. Very glad you were able to come here tonight. Very glad to uh, talk with you uh, the other night, and very glad to see your background. That's very nice that you have behind you. <laughs> glad to see that. Uh, are you an ex-marine? Uh, retired marine. Retired Marine. Okay, sorry. Uh, never, I guess you're never an ex-Marine, are you? Yeah. Okay. No, no, not really ex. Okay. It's not like okay. you can divorce the Marine Corps, unfortunately. Okay. Um, um, uh, perhaps you would like to give people a little bit of background on why you uh, are here tonight. I can tell you, he, David informed me that he's a retired EMT, and you also have some experience with law enforcement. That's correct? That is correct. So a little bit about my background is I've been a uh, paramedic for about 26 years. Um, I have a background in law enforcement. I have a undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina. I have a graduate degree from Johns Hopkins in, um, in forensic chemistry. Uh, I've had a lot of experience treating stab wounds, crime scene investigations, uh, evidence collection, and so forth. So uh, the blood evidence is like that's like right up my alley okay <laughs> okay i hope it's not a bloody alley um <laughs> now are you interested in cases uh you, you've answered my first question is that you've had a lot of experience uh, with these uh, uh stab wounds and blood uh splatter and things like that mm -hmm. uh, is this a case you're particularly interested in, or, or do you <clears throat> focus your interest on a any case that comes across or do you have a particular interest in the in the tate lapianca case professionally or um, as a as a hobbyist, I, I enjoy looking at this case. Mm -hmm. Professionally, I um, when I was in my master's program, I actually wrote a my master's thesis in regards to the uh, Tate LaBianca homicides. Mm -hmm. And it, it, initially, <clears throat> I had believed that um, even under the laws as written in 1969, that Charles Manson never should have been charged with homicide. Mm -hmm. He should not have been. He should not have been charged as an accessory before or after the fact, nor a conspirator before or after the fact. Mm -hmm. And I made that that argument for my thesis and during 
the defense of my thesis and was almost thrown out of my program. Okay, yes, that, that, can, that can happen when you take a contrary view, and especially one that contrary. And I'd like to get into that a little bit with you later, and that's why uh, I said that we'll be talking about uh, blood evidence and more, because that's yeah. the end more. We're going to talk to David about his uh, how he came to his opinions about Charles Manson and being charged in the case. But for starters, let's get back to that front porch, because I'm kind of anxious to get off the front porch, because I don't want people to think that this is the 10,050 Cielo Drive front porch blood analysis podcast. There are many <laughs> other things we can talk about, but uh, I do think it's very important because uh, this is actual physical evidence that we can uh, compare to various interpretations, uh, crime scenarios. Uh, uh, it has to do with witness credibility, uh, timelines. Uh, it, it could suggest different motives uh, depending on what uh, can be determined happened. And uh, any specifically if something was going on between the victims and the killers before the uh, the homicides. And I think that's the main question that we might be able to answer, but might not. But uh, perhaps I can let David, uh, we spoke a little bit on the phone about this the other night, and he gave me some of his observations. And uh, would you like to go ahead, David, and, and start about uh, talking about the blood on the porch? Or I've got pictures and I can show everybody everything. So whatever you want to do, you're the guest. I'm the host. Okay. Ah, fantastic. Um, let, let's, if we could pull up that uh, photograph of the front porch that you had sent me, uh, uh, that one, that, that one one will do just fine okay. to uh, to start out with. So, uh, I want to apologize to anyone who is sensitive that is listening or will listen to this. I am going to describe some things in rather cold clinical terms, and I don't mean to diminuate what happened to these people. They they are human beings, all of them involved here, and I I, I don't want anyone to think that I am just cold hearted. But right. I'm, glad, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're saying that, and I brought that up before because uh, unfortunately these, these people are are the evidence, so we have to discuss them. Right. But I'm glad you brought that up again because we're going to be talking about stabbing people, and uh, we don't mean to be callous. Uh, uh, that's a very good uh, disclaimer, or whatever you want to call it. Right. And, and again, I, I also want to make very clear that I am not an attorney. I do not hold a law license. I never went to law school. That That's not what I do. Any opinions that I may offer in regards to this case are mine and mine alone based on my education and my experience and uh, should not really be taken as anything other than one person's opinion uh, regardless of of how informed or in some cases maybe misinformed it may be it is only my opinion but with that being said um let's let's take a look at at, at some blood evidence so it's important to remember that human beings have a finite amount of circulating blood volume so we're going to talk about blood a little bit. There's two parts to blood, and I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, but I, I, I kind of want to make sure that we're all using the same lingo and, and we're all on the same sheet of music with this. So blood has two portions. It has a solid portion, which would be the cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, uh, portions of uh partially destroyed blood cells that are used in the healing process and so forth. Then there's the liquid portion, which is the plasma portion. Blood is considered a body tissue, just like your skin is, with a liquid and solid portion. Blood has in it certain properties that allow it to clot. And, and depending on what the state of someone's health is, and to my knowledge, no one involved here has any type of hemophilia, is, has any type of congenital um, um, bleeding disorders, for lack, of, for lack of better words, to keep it simple. So we're all going to assume that the victims in this case have normal blood clotting there, and there's no hematological abnormalities because we don't have any evidence of that. When I look at this photograph here, I see a little less of an imprint, and the, one of the first things that draws my eye as a paramedic, as a healthcare provider, is the amount of clotting, that those dark, almost black spots that are at the top just, just to the right of the pillar, 
those are coagulants. That is clotted blood. So what happened is someone hemorrhaged for a while. There was a, enough blood here that it aggregated together. The clotting began, and these clots formed on the ground. I don't see any evidence that these clots formed, say, in someone's clothing or were deposited in any other manner than the fact that someone bled here a lot. The science in 1969 did not give us DNA. So we have blood types and we also have subtypes. But part of the problem is... There's commingled samples, and what I mean commingled samples is there are samples that cannot be identified to one specific person. So there could be multiple blood types as well as multiple subtypes in any given sample. At the time in 1969, there was no way to separate them, and we did not have uh, DNA. So what tools were available at that time were vastly limited compared to what we have a human male has approximately six to six and a half liters of circulating volume in their in their body at any given time an adult female has a five five and a half maybe six depending on her size liters of circulating blood volume and then a pregnant woman a pregnant woman can increase her circulating volume by up to one third, in some cases more, some cases less, but in general, 33.3 to infinity percent greater amount of blood, and that's to supply the fetus. Women can also, when they're pregnant, go through something called autotransfusion. So the, the body will go to great lengths to preserve the host, which is the mother, so that the fetus, which technically is a is a parasite it lives off of the of a host will go to great lengths to preserve the host to preserve the fetus so sharon may have had a significant more circulating volume what i what i did find and maybe i just didn't read it or i missed it somewhere was the amount of blood recovered at autopsy which is something that we do look at now so when we do a post-mortem on someone especially in the instance of traumatic injury with gross hemorrhaging so cause of death was exanguation they bled out we want to know how much blood was collected at autopsy so when we go back and we look at the scene we can we can make an educated guess because I don't like to say assumption. We can make an educated guess of approximately how much blood volume would be there between clothing, rugs, transport in the ambulance if there was any, as well as recovered at autopsy and say, okay, we can account for ninety percent of this person's circulating volume. What we have here in this photo looks to me like that someone bled a lot at that location for a significant period of time. So when the body incurs trauma, we go through a fight or flight or what we call a sympathetic surge. And what happens during sympathetic surge is the peripheral vasculature, so the veins and arteries in the arms and the legs and the hands and the feet, they begin to clamp down. And what that's doing is it's pushing all of that blood into the center, into the core of where your, what we call end organs are. So as that happens, if someone has a wound, say, to their forearm, it will bleed less initially. Now, as that sympathetic surge happens, adrenaline, which is produced in the adrenal glands, which are just above the kidney, gets released into the central circulation, into the blood. Heart rate goes up, respiratory rate goes up, gastric, um, what we call peristalsis, movement of the GI tract slows down, pupils die. This is your fight or flight or freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. What I see here is someone may not have had a chance for their lower brain function to hit fight, flight, or freeze almost like an ambush attack, almost. 
because the amount of blood that is here is significant to the point that it was coagulated on the ground. Now, whether this is a body imprint, I, I don't think that, that this photo provides enough scale to say, oh, well, this is an imprint or someone laid here. But what I would be willing to state based on my education and my experience is someone bled a lot here obviously now in this photo also what we see is areas of lighter shades of red or rose and that is lesser amount of blood and what i find interesting is the sample where omn is marked in this photograph was taken from an area of really comparatively minimal evidence if i was going to collect a sample from here or multiple samples i would want to take it from those areas of in the areas of those coagulated portions because i would have the best opportunity to get a sample that would be of evidentiary value if this were to go to court now that's one portion what i also find interesting is on that pillar <clears throat> There is what I would classify as an arterial spray. So the circulation system within mammals is a closed system. It has two sides. One is a high pressure side. One is a low pressure side. So the ventricles re get blood returning from the body. The um, atrium pumps it into the left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps it back out to the body. So the left side of the heart is the high pressure side. That's the arterial side. Arterial blood is generally more red in color because it's been oxygenated. So the, the iron binding sites on the red blood cells are occupied by oxygen and it's under higher pressure. An insult to an artery is going to produce a spray, more like a water pistol or your garden hose. And a venous hemorrhage is going to have darker blood and is going to be under less pressure pressure so what i see there in this photo could possibly be arterial hemorrhage which means somewhere an artery was insulted and even a small artery say the temporal artery which kind of runs from in your in your temple area and maybe behind your ear in contrast to the aorta it's a very small artery but an insult to that artery can cause a lot of hemorrhage any scalp wound is going to bleed a lot because the vasculature is very close to the surface of the skin my assessment of this picture is someone bled here for a significant amount of time i do not see gross drag marks i do see droplet I do see what might be arterial hemorrhage. Now, if we could go, George, to the other photo, the 69059593 photo, which is another porch photo. Yes. Okay. So in this photo, what, I, what I'm seeing here, again, is a, is a significant amount of blood. Now, in just to the right of the chair, what I see there is I see a seam in the pavement which could have collected that blood which would account for the large amount of coagulated material there possibly um, what i also see is droplets of blood and what those droplets of blood kind of signify to me i wish we had better photos because we could actually see the direction in which someone was traveling mm -hmm. based upon the droplet evidence but right. we don't have that to work with but that could possibly be as you showed in your experiment that could be blood running off of a bladed instrument i would like to talk just for a moment about knives and knife wounds <clears throat> human tissue body tissue is soft it has almost the consistency of soil it will compress at the tip of a knife so if you have a four and a quarter inch buck knife, that can penetrate almost eight inches into the human body. 
and we have something that we call the cone of injury. So from as a paramedic, if I'm evaluating a stab wound, I have to think to myself, from this stab wound in 360 degrees, what injuries could occur so I could properly treat this patient. All of the wounds that were noted at autopsy were all smooth wounds, which indicate to me that no serrated knives were used at Cielo Drive, which is, is consistent with the evidence that was recovered. But what I also find interesting is as I was reading Jay Sebring's autopsy, his autopsy indicates that the wound that took that man's life insulted the nominal artery or the nominal branch of the aorta, which is very significant. So the aorta comes out of the left side of the heart from the left ventricle. It moves blood in two directions, towards the head and down towards the feet. So the branches that come off of the aortic arch that move superiorly, so towards the top of the head would be the common carotid, both branches of the common carotid artery, the anominal artery, the pulmonary vein. So there's actually veins and arteries in the circulatory system that where you will have a vein that carries primarily oxygenated blood. So the pulmonary vein, as well as um, branches out of what we call the, what's called the carotid sinus, which then go into the coronary arteries. The innominal branch was insulted to the point where it was almost severed off of the aorta, which I find interesting because that tells me that wound was done with significant force. It was done, it was done in a manner in which the cutting edge so the running edge of that knife was in the same direction as the midline of the body. So the cutting edge was kind of moved towards the sternum. That is what, according to the ME, caused that man to die. The gunshot wound, I believe, was a contact wound or almost contact wound. It was very close. When he was shot, he was very was shot very close because even the medical examiner said that under fluorescence there was bullet fragments that could not be removed at dissection but back to the back to the knives which really uh blunt force trauma penetrating trauma was the primary cause of of most of the injuries the knives that were used could have caused injuries within eight inches of any entrance wound this blood that I see in the spots could be droplet blood. So there could, ha there could have been, it would be reasonable to think that maybe there was an altercation on this front porch. So legally, when we talk about reasonableness, what we, what we jurors are asked is, if something is judged reasonable, legally, it's a two-pronged test. And I'm not an attorney, but I do understand what reasonable means. So it means what would someone with the same information, same education, believe given the same circumstances? Would it be reasonable to believe that an altercation happened on this front porch? Based upon the blood evidence that I see here, I believe that it is reasonable that someone hemorrhaged, exanguated, on that front porch. Now, whether that was at the initial time when the, when the uh, actors made initial contact with the residents or whether that was later as the events progressed on, I can't say because I have no, no evidence. I have no idea. But someone did a lot of bleeding on that front porch. No doubt about it. Now, now, you mentioned when you were t speaking to me that how much blood do you estimate uh, is covered by these two stains? You said something like two liters, I think. Yeah, uh, based on I mean, the photographs. Know. Yeah, based on the photographs, I would say two to two and a half liters okay. of blood can be accounted for. Now, it could be more. 
sure. it could it could it could be less, but there could be other blood that say maybe seeped into the uh, mulch that we're not seeing. Yeah, so, yeah. but but based on that, I would say at least two to two and a half liters. Now, yeah, so we don't know that that two and a half liters all came from the same person because I think you told me that if if Wojciech Rykowski had lost two and a half liters at that point and in the assault on him, he would not have had the energy or uh, to crawl the additional however many feet it was to where his body was found. Is that correct? Uh, that's what I believe. Yes, yeah. uh, that uh, uh, even during fight or flight, and that the human body is is absolutely amazing. It can really take punishment as we saw with with Wojciech his mm -hmm. he took a lot of punishment in this assault right. but two and a half liters down of blood I uh, I have difficulty believing we're coming up with a scenario where if that was a single depositor of, of that blood that he would have mm -hmm. had the energy even with sympathetic search even dumping mm -hmm. adrenaline into mm -hmm. his body because remember as that adrenaline comes in the heart's going to start beating faster the problem is as the heart beats faster to pump more blood around what's happening it's pumping more blood around so it's yeah. beginning to lose blood from the wounds even the stab wounds that may self-occlude mm -hmm. will eventually begin to hemorrhage so i i i don't think that Wojtek would have if that's his blood would have would have been able to make it to where his body was found well wouldn't that wouldn't that indicate that it couldn't have all been his blood i mean what if a liter of that blood was Wojciech's? could he have still made it out to the front lawn do you think yeah i think if, if he lost a, a single liter of circulating volume yes absolutely okay, okay. So that means uh, a significant portion of that blood is not Voitex because then he likely couldn't have been able to make it to the lawn. And that's pretty good evidence. Right. right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as far as the other uh, is the arterial splatter and everything, do you think could have come from uh, head wounds that were inflicted on him when he was struck with the revolver? If you're talking about uh, arteries behind the ear and I, I understand the, when the scalp bleeds quite a bit when it's a hemorrhage. Is that true? It, oh, absolutely! It does. Absolutely, it, uh -huh. it, it, scalp wounds can can be very deceiving. <clears throat> Excuse me. In some cases, a wound that hemorrhed that is hemorrhaging from the scalp may actually look worse than it is. Mm -hmm. So, it, anyone who who remembers wrestling from back in the day, the uh, WWF wrestlers used to carry a little piece of a razor blade and used to cut their scalp, and they would have blood just running down their face. Yeah. Okay. from a very small scalp wound so yeah okay. that that arterial hemorrhage without being able to do dna matching right. it could be his if yeah. the proper um types and, and and subgroups are present which are consistent with his blood type short now how much of the blood and of course it's hard to tell with these photographs and it's 50 years ago and we have kind of uh, incomplete police reports to go on and as you said we don't have dna and other things uh, that we have now uh would you think that uh how much of the blood let, let's just say a liter was not his just to pick an to pick an amount would it be possible for a liter of blood from J sharon tate polanski and jay sebring to be transferred to that porch or would they have to be uh assaulted there to uh, add to that much blood for that much blood, the donor would have had to be present, okay. in my opinion. They would have had to have been there. The likelihood of transferring, uh, that would be almost like taking a liter bottle of soda mm -hmm. or, or any liquid that would be consistent with blood and punching a hole in the bottom of it and trying to run to the porch before it all it, it mm -hmm. all ran out. So I mm -hmm. believe that the depositor would have had to have been there present on that porch. Okay, well, very good. Well, that's a very good observation. I'm glad you brought it on. It uh, doesn't uh, go with my theory of the crime, but that's not important. What we want to do is find out what's true, not what I think. So I want to add that to the mix and people can make of that what they will. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about uh, if the, let's suppose, uh, and going with our uh, liter of blood left on the porch by either Sharon Tate Polanski or Jay Sebring or both, would you expect to see a larger uh, amount of blood between the porch and where their bodies were finally located in the living room if they were bleeding that substantially on the porch? I would expect to see 
if that much blood was uh, there, there's uh, there's kind of two ways that this could go. So one would one could say, well, if they deposited that much, then they didn't have much left in the container, their bodies, the container. There, mm-hmm. There's not enough left in the container to transfer. Mm-hmm. The other would be, well, if they were bleeding that severely and were moved from the porch into the living room, there should be some evidence of blood smear, drag marks, transfer, Mm -hmm. and and other things that you would associate unless uh, that you would associate with moving someone who has been incapacitated by stabbing and bleeding out basically. Mm -hmm. So it, it, without having reputable eyewitness testimony as to what happened, Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I can render an, a, an opinion that would be definitive at all. Okay. Okay. Well, we know that when we look in the uh, living room pictures, and there are some, uh, here's some, a few other pictures. Here's some blood out on the port or the walkway going down uh, out of way. Uh, in fact, I, I want to point out here, if you look closely at this picture, I believe you can see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you can see Susan Atkins' bloody footprint there on the edge of the, yep. the mm-hmm. port. So, uh, and then here's another uh, picture here showing some stains. This is the blood spatter uh, inside the door jam that we talked about. Would you have any comments on what that indicates to you as far as these patterns here over on the left by the doormat? Right. What I'm seeing there appears to be a a venous hemorrhage, not a arterial hemorrhage. So, so I would, an arterial hemorrhage, I would expect more of a garden hose effect Mm -hmm. where a venous hemorrhage, I would expect the blood generally to remain in the same area. Now on the door jam there, I can see additional coagulants and maybe that's a, that's a drag mark. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that two of the actors pick the bodies up and move them? Mm-hmm. Sure. I can't say with any, with any degree of certainty that that could not have happened, but mm-hmm. that is a lot of blood at that front door and mm-hmm. on that porch. It is significant. Okay. okay. Let me show you another picture here. This is inside the house. Uh, after the bodies were removed over in front of the couch, you can see the blood uh, residue from uh, where Sharon Tate Polanski's body. And over there, uh, over by the corner of the white chair, you can see uh, blood from where Jay Sebring's body was uh, found. Now, uh, there's a, a great amount of blood where Sharon Tate Polanski's body was found. Somewhere, Jay Sebring's uh, body was found. Uh, I, I noted in the autopsy report that they said that in his left left pleural cavity, there was uh, 2,500 cc's of blood, which breaks down to uh, just over two and a half quarts. And that was mm-hmm. blood that was in his body after he was stabbed. So internal bleeding, you've got the bleeding there that's uh, by the chair, by the zebra rug, and also that additional blood in his body that didn't make it out of his body. But I believe it was enough to collapse his left lung and, and hasten his demise. Uh, I, I don't know about that because I'll, I'll tell you, uh, David, you're uh, light years ahead of me on this. I have a BA in German, and so I can't approach you with your expertise. And I've never been on a, I've never been on a, an emergency call. So I, I appreciate very, very much your information you're giving us here. This is very educational for all of us. So uh, would what about these blood stains that we're looking at here? Do those seem to be consistent with people who were uh, incapacitated there or who were placed there after they were uh, attacked somewhere else? Or can you not tell? That's uh, some interesting questions. So it, it, let's take this um, area by area, and, and we'll start with with Mr. Sebring. Mr. Sebring had an insult to a uh, to a fairly large branch of his aorta, which could cause him to lose consciousness within ninety seconds, if not rectified. And unfortunately thoracic trauma like that there's nothing as a paramedic i can do for it they need a operating suite and a thoracic surgeon and a vascular surgeon to to make a repair i believe that the amount of blood that was found on autopsy caused a um, hemothorax which was the blood build up which was then pressing on the lung and i think that would account for the lack of blood in this photograph 
mm-hmm. because most yes. of the blood was contained within, within his body. Okay. So <clears throat> when I teach paramedic students, I teach them, listen, there's three places blood is going to be. It's going to be in the vasculature where it's supposed to be. It's going to be in the third space, which means it's still inside the body, but it's not in the veins and arteries, like what happened mm-hmm. to Mr. Sebring. He had a hemothorax, mm-hmm. blood in his mm-hmm. chest cavity. Or it's going to be on the ground. Those are really mm-hmm. the only three spots blood is going to be. Mm-hmm. So I believe that to be consistent with thoracic trauma that insulted an mm-hmm. in, in artery significant enough to put 2,500 cc's of blood, so two and a half liters of blood in his chest cavity, which would mm-hmm. be a third, about a third of his circulating volume almost. As far mm-hmm. as the other <clears throat> amount of blood that we see there from Sharon. Now, remember, Sharon was pregnant. She was nine months pregnant. She could have had 30%. 33% greater circulating volume than had she not been nine months pregnant, which could account for a significantly greater amount of blood deposited by her. So could she have been attacked on that porch, made it into the, into the living room, exanguated in the, in the living room, secondary to uh, additional assaults? Absolutely. Blood, uh, when it interacts with with surfaces that are porous, like carpets, carpets act like sponges. So there could actually be more blood there than what we are actually noticing, because there could have been ab- uh, absorption into the um, the padding under the rug as well as into the carpet. And I do see an area of significant deposit of blood, and that would be that dark area that is just in front of the middle cushion where mm-hmm. where Sharon had passed at. So I, I would say that she very well could have been assaulted in two places, depending on the type and subtype of, of blood that was found. Now, on the porch, we know that there was commingling of samples. Mm-hmm. And we also have victims <clears throat> here that share the same type as well as the same subtype Mm -hmm. so that's even more difficult Mm -hmm. to 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 uh, separate and uh, could it be done yes today it absolutely could be especially Mm -hmm. if we know that we are looking for genetics from two females and and three males Mm -hmm. so we can say okay we have blood with genetic markers as xx and XY, here is the, the type and the subgroup and the, the, the genetic markers match this person. In 1969, I don't think that they would have been able to do it, especially from a dried sample. A wet sample, maybe, because they could be looking for, if they had enough of a sample, certain hormones that may be present in the blood. So Sharon would have had hormones from her endocrine system that would have been consistent with a woman of nine months pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Abigail Folger was not pregnant at the time, so we would not expect to find them there. And with the three male victims, obviously we're we're not going to find any Mm -hmm. pregnancy hormones with them. Mm -hmm. And that's just science. That's that's science, not my opinion. It's science. Yeah, I, I do well, we're all into the science these days. Now, let me ask you one more question, because, you know, uh, I'm a proponent of the th- belief that a lot of the blood on the porch was carried out by a, a transfer after the assaults in the living room. Uh, I can't get around the fact that the two uh, individuals in the living room, Sharon Tate Polanski and Jay Sebring, were tied together with ropes or rather tied around their necks. So if they were coming <laughs> up into the house, that would have had to have been done uh, after they were assaulted on the porch. And we can think about that for a while and digest it. I wanted to ask you another question. What do you think, uh, how much blood, and I don't want to get really uh, gross here, but how much blood do you think a person would have on them, if you can give an educated guess, if you had stabbed a pregnant woman in the heart three times? I believe she was stabbed in the heart three times, according to her autopsy report. That's a, a, a interesting question. In my experience, stabbing is a very personal assault. 
it is not generally something that is easily carried out <clears throat> by someone who is not fighting for their life or someone who has done it before. To my knowledge, none of these people had ever stabbed anyone to death prior to this. The stabbing motion, whether it be what we call an ice pick motion or an overhand, generally women will stab overhand because there's a lot more power that can be brought to bear. Men, and the, these are generalities, so it's not mm -hmm. always sure. the case. Mm -hmm. Men generally come upwards in an upward stabbing motion because men have greater upper body strength. Now, that's not 100%. It's not all the time. And depending on the position of the victim and the attacker mm -hmm. could in, uh, could deposit more or less blood. Not only that, how deep were the, were the stabs that were being made at the time? Mm -hmm. Were they mm -hmm. close to any major vessels? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> how many times this, was this person stabbed? So mm -hmm. if you were to, say, strike the common carotid artery, or the jugular vein that is very close to the surface is in what we call zone two of the neck, which is to either side of the windpipe mm -hmm. that would have <clears throat> a spraying effect. There would be a lot of blood almost immediately mm -hmm. stabbing people in the thorax can cause a wound that we call self occluding. So you stab in with the knife in whatever motion you use as you withdraw the knife if all you're doing is pushing it in and pulling it out again, that wound may occlude itself or mm -hmm. close up a bit. Now, mm -hmm. it will bleed, mm -hmm. but if you're not hitting great vessels, it may not bl bleed as much. I would be interested to know when they finally did find the clothing that was discarded, exactly mm -hmm. how much blood was found on those clothes. And in 1969, the ability to separate that and say there's approximately this much of the solid portion of blood that was found in the clothing we don't know they could have been covered head to toe mm -hmm. or they could have just had minimal <clears throat> amounts of blood i've treated patients in the back of an ambulance where i you know i came out head to toe i, I was covered in, in my patient's blood unfortunately mm -hmm. and i've also had people with horrific traumatic injuries that were not bleeding a whole lot mm -hmm. but i still got some blood on me so it's very mm -hmm. difficult to say yeah. what i would expect yeah 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 you know, so much of this is up in the air uh you've given me and us i hope a lot to go on i'm gonna have to listen to this again because i can't keep up with everything uh that you're saying live but I'm definitely going to go back and hear all this uh, and try to uh, place it into some kind of context. Uh, so um, I think, I don't know if I have any more questions about the blood because I don't have any answers either, but I'm glad to have all this information, as I said, and the more information we get, the better off we're going to be uh, coming to a conclusion. So if you have anything else you'd like to say about blood or uh, anything like that, or we can move on to some of your other thoughts about the case and why you think, uh, Manson shouldn't have been charged. Oh, we, we can, I can go on about blood evidence for hours and hours. Okay. So maybe we should just move on and, well, and, we, and maybe, we, maybe we can come back and, and do this again. If there's some oh, unanswered absolutely. questions, because I don't want to overdose everybody. I would, I would certainly like to take a few episodes break from the front porch and, and find something else to do. Maybe we can go over to the LaBianca's house or something, yeah. but, uh, well, why don't you tell me about your impressions about the case? Cause uh, you were in law you, uh, you were a, a, an EMP. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh and what was your position in law enforcement i was a criminal investigator oh you were okay so you have some experience in uh law and prosecutors and did you work for uh, uh privately or were you uh, uh hired by a, an agency of the government like a police department i worked for both so okay. i worked with federal law enforcement and i had also consulted in the private sector okay so you're well you're well uh aware of the mentality that anybody that's accused is guilty or that we often get with police officers and other professionals, but you don't seem to have that view. Would you care to tell us why you don't? Because you know, usually when you talk to some police officer about any of the Manson people, they just think they were, uh, you know, dirt bags who could do no right. So you seem to have come to a different conclusion. Would you like to tell us what you base that on? Sure. I would love to. Um, yeah. Another thing I could probably go on for hours about, but yeah. I won't. 
I will give the cliff note version. All right. Well, we may have you back uh, depending on what you tell us now, because I don't want to go on uh, for hours and hours and hours. We're coming up on an hour already, which is pretty good. Oh, wow. Well, let's, but let's keep going. Let's keep going. Well, tell us about your thoughts about uh, what you mentioned earlier about not thinking he should have been charged, et cetera. So in criminal prosecution, any person accused of a crime has the benefit of being presumed innocent beyond, and here's that reasonable word, beyond a reasonable doubt. The difficulty that I have is Charles Manson cannot be placed at the scene. At no time can anyone place a weapon in his hand. At no time did anyone see him commit an act of deadly force upon anyone at Cielo Drive or Waverly Drive, for that matter. Now, could you charge him with burglary? Sure. Un under uh, California Penal Code in 1969, burglary was the unlawful entry into an occupied structure with the intent to commit a crime. Burglary is not homicide. So when we talk about homicide, we have different levels of murder. So California Penal Code 187, murder you can have premeditated murder, which means that there was malice of forethought. Murder one, you can have murder in the second degree or murder in the third degree. So what they charged him with, in my opinion, Vincent Bugliosi had to do some very serious legal gymnastics to charge murder one. Now, why they said, well, we're going to charge him with murder one because we're charging the people that we believe committed the crimes with first degree murder. And he is a conspirator or co-conspirator before and after the fact there was a conspiracy to commit murder. So at the time, and I believe it holds true now, and I know it does in the federal system in order to charge conspiracy, you have to have two or more people who mm -hmm. agree to commit a, a criminal act and one person takes one action in furtherance of the crime mm -hmm. criminal conspiracy mm -hmm. i have not seen anything where they could have said charles manson told those people to go and do what they did right. knew that they were going to do what they did and did nothing to prevent it right. or knew about it afterwards and did nothing about it conspirator after the fact you might be able to say well he knew about it the problem was this was a case that was tried less in the courtroom and more in the press. Right. It would, if I had been Charles Manson's attorney and I'm not an attorney and I know I keep saying, if I had been his, his attorney, I would have immediately filed a motion for separation, mm -hmm. separate my client from them, mm -hmm. from, from the girls and, and, and Mr. Watson. Because you cannot prove my client was there, he knew mm -hmm. about it, had a weapon, committed any act of deadly force. So an act of deadly mm -hmm. force is force which a reasonable and prudent person would conclude capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. You can't mm -hmm. prove that in right. the case right. of right. Charles Manson. Right. right. That's, that's what I came up with. My uh, amateur legal analysis would have been the same thing, that if he'd separated himself from the, his co-defendants, he would have had a much, be much better chance. Absolutely. I don't think it was in his character to do that because he, I think he thought they were all in it together and he was going to stick with them uh, to the end, which, would, which was originally going to be the uh, gas chamber. So right. I wanted to get back and ask you a little bit about what you said about burglary. Uh, that's entering a, an occupied dwelling with the intention to commit a crime. What if you enter an occupied dwelling with no intention to commit a crime? What if you just enter the occupied dwelling? That would just be trespassing, correct? My I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any uh, crime that uh, Manson uh, committed or had any intent to commit when he went into the Papianca residence. You, uh, right. I would say if I was the person who was charging him, I would say criminal trespass. Um, I would even say maybe even simple trespass, mm -hmm. but I believe it, it rises above in my, my understanding, my interpretation is it rises above because in assault, was committed mm -hmm. so now 
maybe criminal, maybe defiant criminal trespass, if that was in the penal code at that time. Mm -hmm. But to say that he was responsible for the death of the LaBiancas, him, mm -hmm. and, and when I say him, I mean that Charles Manson. Did someone mm -hmm. go in there and murder those people? Without a doubt. And it was a horrible, horrible crime perpetrated mm -hmm. upon those people. Mm -hmm. But I cannot say, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, so I have an amateur opinion on this also. Mm -hmm. I cannot say for sure Charles Manson went in there with the intent of committing a, a crime, let alone went in there or directed homicide be perpetrated upon these people. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see any evidence for that. Yeah. And especially not with Cielo Drive. Right. When he wasn't even anywhere near anything. Wasn't even anywhere near there. Yep. That anybody can prove. Nobody can. <laughs> the, you know, you know. You know, they, they, they try to get him going in later. And I don't know, you, you saw the uh, uh, stuff I talked about, liver mortis and lividity. And would you agree that the bodies could not have been moved more than 20 minutes after they were deceased, uh, controlling the position they were found in, uh, based uh, on the lividity? Yeah, the forensic evidence leads me to believe that the likelihood of those bodies being moved is minimal. Now, let me qualify that by saying, could they have been moved prior to the onset of liver mortis or rigor mortis? Yes, mm -hmm. that is possible. That mm -hmm. is possible. Mm -hmm. But based upon rigor and based upon the liver mortis or that line of, of what we call dependent lividity, where the fluids will pool in, 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 a, in a human, mm -hmm. those bodies were in those positions for a significant amount of time mm -hmm. after the heart had stopped effectively pumping. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not familiar with the uh, timeline on rigor mortis. And, you know, you, you said that that's not a, a super accurate way of determining time of death. But could no. you give me an idea of when, when rigor mortis sets in generally and when it uh, goes away? Very broadly, there are many factors that would go into this. Um, environmental conditions being uh, paramount. It mm -hmm. was warm that evening. Mm -hmm. So the the liver mortis and rigor mortis would begin to set in at the initial stages in the smaller joints of the body, probably within 20 minutes. Okay. Full body rigor would probably take up to an hour, mm -hmm. give or take 20 minutes on either side of that. Again, depending on environmental conditions. The, honestly, mm -hmm. one of the best ways to tell time of death is to assess the can, the environmental conditions when the victim was found and what the temperature of the liver is because the liver being a large solid organ will retain body heat longer than right. say the lung will so mm -hmm. liver temp is really what they needed that's what they they usually take the liver temp i noticed in all the autopsies they went in and took right. the temperatures of the livers right uh, so um where does that leave us? <laughs> That's a great we, still, we don't have any solid answers, but I think we have some more information to go on. And uh, I'm certainly going to digest all this and give us some thought, as I always do. Uh, David, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add uh, on any of this subject, on this time at least? No, this this was fantastic. I absolutely enjoy a, a spirited debate. Uh, I believe that uh, that many of the questions that are coming up now may never be answered. Right. But at the heart of it is, I believe this, a horrible crime was perpetrated upon other human beings that did not need to be perpetrated. Mm -hmm. It was grisly. It was horrible. It damaged families for generations beyond that from a more clinical view of it i believe that there is more information out there than what has been released i honestly believe that there is brady material that i believe was suppressed by the los angeles county district attorney's office Can that you was explain that please so brady material is a, a material that would be exculpatory 
mm. or would tend to lean towards the innocence of the accused. And I believe that there was information and that was intentionally or unintentionally not released to the defense that was mm -hmm. in the possession of the office of the district attorney. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole, that could be a whole nother show. <laughs> well, at least, at least. Yeah. Give me some, give me some more to go into. Definitely. Uh, well, uh, that's very good. You know, I'm very glad that uh, when I reached out to you, you were so receptive and, and, and willing to come on here and share your expertise with us. I know it's been enlightening to all of us. And as I said, I'm going to go over everything you said. I may call you sometime and, and talk about this over the phone and maybe have you back on here after we've come to some more conclusions. But I think uh, we've done about all I wanted to cover tonight. If you don't have anything else you would like to add, uh, I'm not going to open the uh uh, the floor up to other people because it's been about an hour and I want to keep these somewhat, you know, some of these podcasts go on three hours. And when I see that, I don't even start watching them because I, I can't spend three hours doing much of anything. But uh, uh, I'm very glad, uh, David, that you came on. Good talking to us. It's good to yeah. have somebody on here that actually knows what they're talking about and is not talking about theories or suppositions or opinions. So we don't have to come to any conclusions tonight, but we can take what you said and, and study it. And uh, I would encourage anybody uh, who has any uh, ideas that you've uh, come up with from this to contact us and let us know. Maybe we can uh, go on with this some other time. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to thank uh, David uh, York for coming on. I'm very glad to have him. I hope this has been educational to everyone. And uh, we'll call it a night tonight. And we'll, we'll see everybody uh, next time on the next issue or the next episode of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. Fantastic. Well, enjoy the show tonight, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. This has been the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast, the podcast dedicated to the truth about the Tate LaBianca murders, Charles Manson, and more. The views expressed on this program are solely those of the individual speakers, and they do not necessarily represent the thoughts, ideas, or opinions of any other persons, either living or dead. Visit our companion website at www.goodbyehelterskelter.com. There you can find more information about this podcast. Also, check out the Goodbye Helter Skelter Facebook page for information on upcoming programs. And let us know what you think by way of contact at goodbyehelterskelter.com. We will address any comments, questions, or concerns on future installments of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. <laughs>